Yama, Nea Emi Tinig, Gimilare Inar, Winning Elena, Darig Mari, Gunungo Marin, Ne Marin, Inara Dalaga, Gano Mari, Gano Gumili, Nua Iladu. Hello, I'm Amy Tunig. I'm a Gamilaray woman. I acknowledge Darig people, their ancestors, my ancestors, all Darig people, all Aboriginal people, and all who are gathered here today. Where are we gathered today? We're presently standing on the unceded lands of the Darug Nation, but you're more likely to know it as North Ride. Anywhere you may gather across this vast continent now commonly referred to as Australia, you're standing on stolen land, land from which sovereignty has never been ceded and where no treaties are presently in place. How aware of this are you? Truly, beyond, say, implementing an acknowledgement of country, have you ever considered that actually the First Nations people of this land have the right to not welcome you at all? How aware and accepting are you of the fact that you live, work and profit on land that has been stolen within systems that were created with the belief and promise that the First Nations people would soon be annihilated? On this land now commonly referred to as Australia, the systems collectively known as education, media, politics, health, agriculture and policing, all of the elements imposed upon our daily lives, are reflective of a white supremacist ideology that was overtly core to their foundation. We live within that system. A system which was introduced when the British invaded some 200 years ago. They entered a land which for time immemorial had already been home to and continue to be home to complex social, political and familial systems with well-established trade, agriculture and farming, all of which were in good health and appropriate to this climate. Globally, it's now acknowledged that First Nations people of these lands, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, are the oldest continuous people groups in the world. Current dating methods prove over 100,000 years of continuous community right here. If this is news to you, that's no accident. The lie of terra nullius and the assertion of white supremacy relies on perpetuating an image of a primitive hunter-gatherer indigenous person, which naturally then positions the invader as more humane, very well intended, and regardless of outcomes, certainly acting for the greater good. The greater good, invasion brought with it genocide, frontier wars, the introduction of farming and crops, which had and have no place in this climate, the greater good of stealing Indigenous children, blackbirding, and turning families and communities into dehumanised workforces of indentured servants. Introduced on these lands and spreading out over a 230 year period, we, you and I, now live within systems and frameworks which were built from that foundation and are embedded with that legacy. A legacy which reveals itself through ongoing significant social disadvantage, the transgenerational trauma from stealing the children and dispossessing people of their lands, and a climate so sick that the riverbeds are running dry for the first time in human history, which on these lands is a history which spans back time immemorial. But how many times do we need to say this? How many books, articles, reports and inquiries need to be written? See, not only does this system not seek to be questioned, it actually relies on the truth not being heard and received by you, the broader Australian public. It relies on you being conditioned to believe that genocide, the stealing of the land, the ongoing lack of treaty, the ongoing over-policing and over-incarcerating of Aboriginal people and children is all somehow for the greater good. When these truths which I've mentioned are raised, perhaps when questioning the ongoing idolisation of the men and organisations who introduced white supremacy here, we're generally met firmly with two responses. Firstly, any and all discussion, disruption or debate must be done in a civil manner. And secondly, we're told, well, those men and those acts, they're simply products of their time. Products of their time? When did that time end exactly? I'd like us to briefly consider some of those men, their work, and these notions of greater good and civility. Governor Lachlan Macquarie, 
in his governor's diary in 1816, wrote, and I quote, I have this day ordered three separate military detachments to march into the interior and remote parts of the colony for the purpose of punishing the hostile natives by clearing the country of them entirely. In the event of the natives making the smallest show of resistance or refusing to surrender when called upon so to do, the officers commanding the military parties have been authorised to fire on them to compel them to surrender. Hanging from trees, the bodies of such natives as may be killed on such occasions in order to strike the greater terror into the survivors. My family and I live on a Wobbicle land, but you're more likely to know it as Lake Macquarie. I work at Macquarie University, and today I'm giving a TEDx talk under the banner of TEDx Macquarie. Every day I'm aware that these places and spaces continually idolise the very man who not only ordered the killing of First Nations people, but that our dead bodies should be strewn through the trees so as to strike terror in our hearts. We're told to get over it. We can't even get away from it. But it wouldn't be fair of me to only highlight Macquarie, so let's also look at Lieutenant Governor Latrobe, a name you probably know from Latrobe University. Latrobe, like many others of his time, had figured out that Aboriginal people were willing and able to learn the skills like reading and writing, but once done, would return to the love, strength and culture of our mob. He, therefore, concluded that only coercion could overcome our natural propensities to want to be Aboriginal with our family. And he said, nothing short of an actual and total separation from the parents and natural associates, an education at a distance from the haunts and beyond the influence of the habits and example of the tribe would hold out a reasonable hope of their ultimate civilization and Christianization. And it was Lieutenant Governor Ralph Darling of Darling Harbour fame, who came to the conclusion that attempts to educate Aboriginal children had failed, as Aborigines learned to read and write, yet returned to their tribes and remained with them as soon as their education was finished. If we consider this even briefly, it's incredibly clear that none of this was ever for our greater good. It wasn't an opportunity of education. It wasn't for our children's safety. They knew we would and could learn those skills that they valued so dearly, but that we also continued to value our family, our culture and our land. And so they introduced and rolled out the laws and roles that they then used to steal our children. And if we fast forward to 1907, we've got James Isdell, a Western Australian pastoralist and parliamentarian holding the role of travelling protector. He reported to his superior, I would not hesitate to separate any half-caste from its Aboriginal mother, no matter how frantic the momentary grief might be at the time. They soon forget their offspring. Products of their time. A time where cruel and inhumane acts are put forward as centering civility, as framed by Christian and Anglo-centric values. So what about us? It's time to question what products and acts are going to be the result of our time. Many Indigenous activists, various academics, and a pretty basic data analysis contends that genocide is an ongoing process in an Australia that has failed to decolonise. More Aboriginal children are forcibly removed from their families today than during the era now formally known as the Stolen Generation. Yet in both eras, the argument of for their greater good is employed. But unlike the people of the 1900s, the broader Australian population, that's you, will not be able to engage in any cover of plausible deniability. See, we are an empowered set of generations with many conduits of communication, the ability to talk to one another across continent, across the globe in real time, and the ability and resources to fact check, right? I assume in highlighting these quotes and these stats to you that you don't want to actively contribute to ongoing oppression and genocide, that this doesn't please you. But how many of you ignore our mass protests every January 26, fail to take any action when we are over-policed, over-incarcerated and continue to die in police custody and police presence? 
and say to yourselves, if not to one another, well, they'd get a lot further if they behaved in more civil debate. Civility is too often a word used to say, seek your freedom my way, which is to say, do not seek it at all. And on hearing this, you might think that you want to help me. And I appreciate that intent, but I am here today to challenge it. Lilla Watson says it so perfectly when she says, if you've come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you've come because your liberation is bound up in mine, then let us work together. These systems are not broken. They are working exactly as they intend. We, the masses, are crushed in order to prop up the wealth and the power of the few. And First Nations people, we're at the bottom of that crushing pile. No, I don't want to succeed in a system that locks families seeking asylum into gulags known as offshore detention centre. I don't want success in a system that says 10-year-olds have criminal liability and lock children up in jail. I don't want success in a system where there are eight job seekers for every one available job, yet those experiencing unemployment and homelessness are labelled bludgers. In that system, propaganda, dehumanising language and the control of the masses under the power of the few continue. That system has a recent Prime Minister who literally says that 100,000 years' wealth of land, culture, trade and family was nothing but bush because it was prior to 1888. Where another recent Prime Minister denies genocide even took place despite masses of evidence to the contrary. Another recent Prime Minister says challenging colonial idolisation is akin to Stalinism and where despite knowing we're on track to be decimated by climate change, our current Prime Minister insists that coal and this direction is in Australia's best interest. <laughs> Whose interest? It was recently revealed that wealth inequality in this country is growing. The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. But this little tidbit was left out of the ABS press release as it apparently doesn't make a good story. No, I don't want success in a system where the New South Wales government are granting permits to drain our rivers, the Queensland government are, let's not even go there, the Victorian government are putting more money into developing and supporting prisons than they are into supporting health and schooling services. A system which, despite so much evidence to the contrary, insists that Western democracy is a meritocracy. And we can sit around and laugh about what a sickening joke that is, and people can decry, this is not our Australia. But actually, for some 200 years up and into today, it really is your Australia. Because despite some success in challenging certain laws, these systems continue to perpetuate this practice of centering the few on the active oppression of everyone it deems to be an other. But the good news is, Recognising this means recognising that these systems are not an inevitable evolution. They are not an accident, nor are they fate. They are crafted, introduced, normalised. That means that we can challenge them. Change is not out of our hands. I do not want to join you in that existing system. I want you to join me in challenging it. We are a people of our time, a time of smartphones, social media, collective action and mass communication. Let us also be a time of disruption and dismantling. The few may claim authority, but we, you and I, have the power. And so I say to you, disruption is not only our opportunity, it is our collective responsibility. Thank you. <laughs>